my friend and I decided to take a bike ride one day. He, he rides all e-bikes. He's had some injuries and he used to be a bike rider, but he rides an e-bike, he rides a gazelle now. And we decided to take a bike ride. So there's Dale. And we, we asked a friend on, on his street to ride with us. So we all went out on a ride and a few people saw us riding and started asking about their e-bikes. And it grew to four or five. Now there's a, a group of about 90 people who they call themselves easy riders and they take a ride every Friday morning. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman and that is Gary Audi from the Temecula Valley Bicycle Coalition in Temecula, California. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, the whole Temecula scene and how he and his group of advocates and community members are trying to make the area a little bit safer and more inviting for people walking and biking. Let's get right to it with Gary. Gary, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me, John. <laughs> Absolutely. And hey, I love giving my guests the opportunity uh, to just say a few words uh, to introduce themselves. So Gary, you have the floor. Well, I am Gary Adi, and I am the president of Bike Temecula Valley, which is an active transportation advocacy group. It, it, it does expand from, you know, being a bike advoc advocacy group as, as typically this, this works into. But we started off as being a bike advocacy, gr advocacy group. And um, as we've been progressing, we've become more of an active transportation advocacy group and we're real conscientious about being inclusive and and trying to get some diversity going so we we want to cover all forms of active transportation my wife and i moved to temecula in 1989 we had been uh, working in the education field before then and we had a, our young family that we were uh, growing at that time and moved down to temecula from the Ontario, California area. Uh, we had lived uh, previous to that in, in Ventura, California, and um, then back to Ontario and on to Temecula, where we felt like we had a pretty good opportunity uh, with a, a small growing community to um, grow our family. Uh, we now have three adult daughters and two grandchildren. One of the daughters uh, currently lives here in Temecula uh, with my two grandchildren. And then my other two daughters are in the San Diego area in Del Mar and uh, North Park. And all three of my daughters are educators, just like uh, my wife, Debbie, and I. So we are a family of educators. Most of my background in my career was teaching secondary school. I've been a elementary school principal, um, a secondary school administrator, an athletic director. My final and, and most favorite uh, position was my last six or seven years. Um, I went back into the classroom and taught um, higher level psychology courses at Great Oak High School. So that's kind of my background. I'm currently, like I said, very busy with this advocacy group, um, nonprofit, and I am a commissioner for community services here in the city of Temecula, and also the coordinator of the Murrieta Creek Regional Trail. So really ab able to keep busy, busy in the areas of my passion. Fantastic. That's great. Yeah. And uh, before we hit the record button, you know, we were reminiscing a little bit on several different things. And, and one of it, one of the things that I had mentioned to you is that I do have family uh, now in the Temecula area and I'm long overdue for a, a, a trip. I, I recently took the Active Towns tour through uh, Temecula. Um, and I say recently, it's not that recent. It was about 2017, I think is when it was. So it's, I'm again, I'm, I'm long overdue for, for a visit there. But what's really interesting about your particular situation and that particular area is just how much it has changed since you moved there. Talk a little bit about that, because this is one of the situations in Southern California where, you know, that whole area, the Temecula Valley, really sort of just blossomed and blew up in terms of uh, of a uh, 
a community, it, it, it's, it, it's, you know, the term, you know, the bedroom community of, of where, you know, there was a lot of housing being built and there was an opportunity for, for people to be able to find an affordable place to live. Uh, you know, for instance, my sister, I, I had mentioned that she lived there for a short period of time. And the whole reason why they moved out into that region, I think it was a little further away from you in Menifee, it was because it was an affordable place to live. Well, absolutely. I think it sustained that and still does, relatively speaking, to the communities around us, uh, San Diego, North County, San Diego, Orange County, L.A. County. It, this, is, this is an inexpensive way to go for um, you really get the same thing you get in North County, San Diego for a little less cost because we're just across the border in Riverside County. But um, yeah, we, we um, were a, a, you know, a, a country um, type area when we moved here. Um, a lot of equestrian, a lot of agriculture. And of course, the wine industry was just starting to get going um, with our vineyards. But we've become a, a pretty good example of sprawl, and we, we are now a, a bedroom suburb community. The, the little bit of the history, I, I, in my introduction, did, didn't say this, but I'm the son of a steel mill worker. And my uh, father was a steel worker at Kaiser Steel in Fontana, California. So when I was a young child in the 1960s, I actually came out here with my father and my uncle and we visited and there was nothing. It was just a, a little town and a lot of ranches. But the reason I brought that up is that Kaiser Corporation had bought the land in this area and had a, a general plan to develop it. So that was the original developer. And, and back then we thought it was a pretty nice plan. And when we moved here, the plan looked good. And I, I was somewhat clueless on urban development at the time. I am still not an expert on it, but I've gotten a lot more in tune to it and being in an active transportation advocacy group. So we, we have a lot of the issues that any community um, that is dealing with sprawl and freeways running through the middle of the city. But at the same time, this community has um, kept its its small town appeal in that process. And that's one of the things that as a, um, a leader in the city, we keep talking about and people talk to us about in our surveys that, yeah, it's a, it's a bigger town. We're, we're over 100,000. It's a mid-sized city. Um, you add Marietta in and you're starting to approach um, a half a million. But the comments are always, it's, we, we want to maintain that small town feel. And so that's kind of in our, our master plan to, to keep that going. Yeah. And uh, I'll pull up the map here and give uh, folks uh, some bearing in terms of uh, where Temecula actually is. And so we're sort of just looking at uh, an overview of uh, most of Southern California. And uh, as I mentioned, a lot of my family um, was up in the uh, the 210 corridor there, uh, up in Glendora and Pasadena and, and that whole neck of the woods. Originally, the family was in L.A. and then Highland uh, Park area right around the turn of the century in 1900. And then in the 1950s, started making their way towards uh, Glendora and Pomona in that area. But yeah, if you take a look at, you know, so, sort of where we're at here, Temecula is like inland, you know, sort of really as the crow flies, just inland from where the, uh, the, the military base is, the Camp Pendleton Marine Base. And so that's on the other side of the mountains there. And you zoom in. And you're right, you know, you see the interstate, you know, sort of I-15, you know, rolling right through here, right on the edge. Uh, it looks like the western edge of the most of the development uh, for the city. And then, of course, you've got Highway 79, you know, poking through there as well. And uh, you mentioned the, the magic word there, the vineyards, and you can see a lot of the wineries and the vineyards off in the distance here. That was really uh, a development that sort of built over time. And, and I, I have some history with the, the wine country in Northern California. Uh, some of my favorite uh, bike rides and some of my favorite uh, triathlons that I used to participate in were up in uh, the, the Sonoma County area and uh, you know, through the vineyards. So that really kind of changed a lot of the dynamic of Temecula is the fact that the vineyards really took off. Well, absolutely. I mean, in terms of um, 
tourism. It's it's one of our legs, and you know, as an advocacy group for active transportation, we we're hopeful that we 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 talk about two legs of, of tourism in Temecula. It's, it's one of them has to do with drinking and the other has to do with gambling. So we, we want to be the third leg that has to do with healthy, active lifestyle, you know? So uh, I know when my wife and I travel, we love to do tours that involve hiking or riding bikes. And I think that would be something great to add here. It was a great map you put up because it, it had a little bit of the topography and you brought you know, to the forefront that as the crow flies uh, at the um, westernmost point of Temecula, we're only 14 miles to the Pacific coast. Right. So, yeah, now you can't get there because you do have the marine base. You do have some preserves that you can't build build roads on. Um, so you have to go around that. It puts us about an hour to get to the beach with, with no traffic. But um, that 14 miles, there's, there's basically a little mountain range that uh, there's a gap called the Rainbow Gap. And um, the sea breeze comes through there and cools us off at night and makes us a, a real Cal, uh, California, chaper- California coastal chaparral area. One of the myths is the, the, from a lot of people have is they, they see how close Temecula is to, let's say, Palm Springs, and they think, oh, Temecula is in the desert. Um, but it is. It's really a, a nice um, coastal chaparral. You can compare it to Tuscany or Provence. Um, in Europe, where they grow some pretty good grapes too. And it's just really uh, well set and now becoming a little more mature uh, wine country where our wines are really starting to, to take hold and, and compete with some of the other, other wine areas. We went from when we moved here to um, eight wineries to now well over, well over 50 wineries in yeah. the region. Yeah. Very fascinating. It's, it's all, I'm always you know, curious about how you know, that sort of emerges and, you know, from a, from an agricultural perspective, um, my family, uh, we left the Southern California area in 1972 and moved up to Northern California. And so I grew up on a ranch, uh, in Northern California. And so I was in 4-H and FFA as a, as a child, uh, you know, growing up in my little town of Lincoln, California. Uh, and so I have that sort of angle of having grown up on a little ranch and having been agriculture and related uh, whenever I see something like this, where you start to see an industry sort of take off, you know, like vineyards and, and uh, and you're like, ah, interesting. That's, that's, that's cool. And we actually ended up seeing that happen up in Lincoln too, is that many, many vineyards started popping up in, in areas that, that used to be relatively unproductive cattle land. <laughs> so it was like, exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's what we were. We were Vale Ranch and um, the, the Spanish ranchos. And, and now, you know, that's kind of gone away and we're mostly vineyards, some citrus, but, but, but most of the, mostly vineyards. I, and I think, you know, I, I wanted to make kind of two points on the map you showed too. When you zoomed in on that map of Temecula, you could see kind of the circular neighborhoods. We have a lot of small neighborhoods with loops around them and the auto loops. And so it's kind of interesting if you were to go to my previous community, Ontario, which was at the turn of the 20th century was built by the Chafee brothers. It is a very um, grid oriented, planned out community with beautiful Euclid Avenue running right down the middle of it. But you're looking at that map right now of Temecula and you see these circular, which got a lot of accolades from a lot of city planning experts, some from um, the the famous city planning at um, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo made comments about how well planned Temecula was. And actually it has some benefits, but but for the most part, when you talk about active transportation, it, the way it was set up in a sprawl format um, has created some issues with how we move about our community. And then you go out to the wine country, which is, is generally in the county of, of Riverside, known by the county, um, you have these rural roads that have now become more throughways, highways to get it because we're really packing them in in the summertime and on weekends and even now on weekdays. I just was at a 
a meeting last night uh, for a group called uh, Timeless Temecula Trails, which is a collaboration between equestrian, biking, and hiking to try to develop the county trails program in wine country. So right now, we don't have a lot of trails. The trails we do have are not networked. We do have some safe routes, but folks don't really know about them. So we see a lot of folks riding bikes, whether they're road road riders or weekend um, e-bike rentals um, that happen out here in the vineyards are riding on our busy streets. And um, we've already had some pretty bad accidents. And um, so one of our focuses as an advocacy group is to promote safe riding out in our vineyards because it is beautiful. It is a a wonderful place to ride and be inspired. Yeah. And we'll go back to the safe uh, routes in just a second, but you got me inspired to, to zoom in on Ontario now. So you can take a look at that grid and you're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, here is your typical grid pattern um, that we're used to seeing you know, throughout uh, human development, uh, you know, a, a pretty standard grid format was what uh, traditional neighborhoods and how traditional neighborhoods were, were designed. And quite frankly, you see this, you know, across most of the Southern California Valley. When you zoom in on the heart of Los Angeles the, that was platted out at the turn of the century, it, it's all uh, in a very, very walkable, tight grid pattern. And it's one of the reasons why um, the city of Los Angeles actually has a pretty impressive density level is because the, the blocks were short and there was, you know, lots of them and it was all on a grid. It wasn't, as you mentioned, until later on where we started developing uh, the suburban sort of context in the in the the loopy sort of cul-de-sac types of, of developments. Uh, and so that really took off later, not so much what was planned, you know, plotted out, uh, you know, through the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and into the 60s, it really started to take off 70s, 80s, and 90s. And then it got really crazy. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, 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 it gives you a, um, I know that many of the city planners right now and, and engineers are, are trying to fix, you know, what they broke um, as these grids became overwhelmed. But as you, as you try to fix something that has this curvature circular type plan to it, it, it makes it even more difficult than with the grids. You know, I have um, my brother-in-law had been on the planning commission in Ontario for years and he fought so much for, you know, getting their nice old downtown, that was just, just beautiful with a train stop and everything, um, you know, to, to try to get it to be a little, little car free and a little more, you know, accentuate the beauty of Euclid Avenue, but, you know, fighting the battle um, and, you know, generally losing in many, in many cases. So, um yeah, I, I just think that that's kind of an interesting little issue we have as as we're you know working through it. But you know it it's uh, just interesting. I I think anyway there there are these nice little isolated neighborhoods, right? So when we moved down here, our first home was at the end of a cul-de-sac, and so we had this nice quiet cul-de-sac. Our kids were able to go out and ride their bikes in the street, play ball, hockey, you know, whatever, right on the street. We'd, we'd go sit out on the, the front porch or open our garage door and sit inside in the shade and watch them play. And then our second house was also on a great cul-de-sac, which had very much the same thing. Uh, my daughter uh, lives on, a, on the end of a cul-de-sac where her, her kids can do the same thing. But the problem is, is when those kids want to go to a friend's house who live in a different area, now you're dealing with, you know, some pretty dangerous intersections, some strodes, and that's a problem. My son-in-law just bought, just bought a really nice cargo bike that fits both kids on the back. The plan is, you know, to take them to the store and, and uh, ride them, ride them to school, but he just can't find a safe route to do it. So, you know, the cargo bike is stranded for a, for a lot of time right there at the house be, because of that. So we have these nice little isolated places, but it, our, our struggle is to how do we get them connected? Yeah. Um, and that's what we're working on. 
And if we, we zoom back in on the, the map here uh, of Temecula, we, we notice that there's a lot of green out there. And I do have the, the layer mode uh, on Google Maps uh, turned on for the bicycle network. And so we're able to see that there's a fair amount of green here. I suspect a fair amount of this green, though, is, is probably uh, no more than just a painted bike lane. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the difference between a painted bike lane, lane and an all ages and abilities and separated facility in, in a little bit. But I wanted to reflect on something that you just mentioned about, you know, this concept of, you know, having a cul-de-sac sort of neighborhood and you have lots of curvy roads and, and all of this. I had the opportunity to live in a suburban, you know, cul-de-sac sort of neighborhood uh, in Brea there in North Orange County uh, for about five years. And it was before I was really thinking in these terms. I was still in my corporate fitness and health promotion realm of my career. This would have been back in the early 90s. And I didn't realize at the time, but I happened to live in a neighborhood where all of these cul-de-sacs were were penetrated by walking and biking pathways. And then those walking and biking pathways through those cul-de-sacs connected to a green space, which had a whole network of off-street multi-use paths that connected to all of the other parks and all of the schools. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize, I knew I loved it because I was a runner at the time. And so I would go and run on those trails all the time, those pathways all the time. But I was like, oh man, th that was really brilliant. And it had to have been platted and built out probably in the early 80s because uh, like I said, it was right around 1990 when we moved into, into that neighborhood. And it seems like that was something that was missed and lost with the subsequent neighborhoods that got built out, you know, out in Menifee and out in Temecula was to plan that out from the beginning is to have each of those cul-de-sacs be, you know, have a, have a multi, you know, have a multi-use path, a, a way for people walking and biking to be able to penetrate through and then get out and have a whole network of off street network of, of pathways that could help connect neighborhoods. Because to your point, yeah, you can't get there from here if you're, you know, a family, you know, and you're living with kids and they're like, yeah, right on the backside of our house <laughs> over here is my best friend, but I can't get to him unless I climb over the fence. Right. I mean, um, it seems like absolutely. an opportunity lost, you know, especially since clearly the, the, the foresight was there, at least with some developments. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it, like I said, it was um, seen as a great plan. Um, these small neighborhoods, but again, no services, right? Um, maybe, maybe a school that kind of came, you know, a little bit later, actually after the plan. But there's one very circular community called Paloma del Sol, which has a couple of car loops on the outside which is one, and then the inside, it's a lot of green, green belts. Yeah, I think you're looking at it right there. You can see that those are, um, you know, the green belt areas are concrete bike and, and walking trails. They look like oversized sidewalks. Uh, so you can ride your bike around in there, you know, quite, quite a bit. You can, you can fairly safely ride it on the loop, which is 40 miles an hour on the loop, on that outside <laughs> loop. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> the single lane uh, with a buffered buffered bike lane, uh, but then if you if you you know extend out of that you know you, now you're dealing with some issues. So um, one of the things we've been doing is we've been ferreting out the calm calm neighborhoods, and we we can go across town in all kinds of different directions um, by you know wandering about wandering into those trails and then on just some calm roads and so forth but i think when you say you know you 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 were in that neighborhood and then you realize well that was ingenious i it, it's amazing to me too cuz i i moved down here and we're we're just accepting well they say it's a great plan and that's what they say and i had a job at a school called nicola uh, the name was nicholas valley elementary school it's up on the north side of town i was the principal there our staff would, you know, about five or six of us would go out for a run, you know, once in a while after school just to, 
you know, have a little buffer before we got home. And we were right next to this trail, which is our main trail here in town right now. It's called the Santa Gertrudis Trail. So it's a, a, a trail built along the uh, a creek. And it was done in 1991 by the by county flood control. And as yeah, I'm, I'm speaking there at, at the grand opening of our undercrossing, and I'll I'll get get to that in a second. But this, this kind of ties in. So I I was just thrilled. There was a four mile strip of trail, and we would run you know out and back and have a nice run along the creek without not having to deal with cars. But that sat from 19, uh, when I was uh, principal at that school from 1993 to about four or five years ago, when we then started talking about finally extending the trail. So the city did a great job of putting money in their their SIP funds and um, getting a matching grant to go under our freeway and there you go. That is um, going under Jefferson Avenue, which then it continues on under the I-15 freeway. If you if you go off to the left on that trail, this is when the the trail was um, newly newly opened here. About it, it's it's a um, little over a year now. The trail's been open, um, to going under the 15 freeway. So now we can actually use that trail. But I I I, I want I just wanted to make that point. Is what was I thinking? You know, I I loved it and I wanted more of it, but I guess back then I could go out and ride my bike. There was a lot of open space. There wasn't a lot of, you know, I didn't have to deal with traffic. And I'm thinking, you know, the talk was, well, we're going to have this loop trail that goes around the whole town, 17 miles, and you, you know, you'll be on a, a separated trail the whole way. But anyway, th- this was big for our city. We, I was speaking there at the grand opening and our then mayor said that, you know what, Temecula can be bike town, Southern California. And he, and he related to the fact that Dave, Davis, California is bike town, California. Well, we do have the potential. We definitely have the potential. We have the weather. We have the, the amount of people riding bikes that we need. <laughs> you know, we, we could use more, but we just don't have the um, ability to put up these types of class one trails very uh, quickly. We applied for a grant, um, which we have matching funds for on the south side of town on the Temecula Creek, um, which would be the southern segment of our loop trail. Um, and we were denied that that grant. So we're, we're back in the pool again this year, trying to get the funds um, to get that, that segment done. Some great ideas, some uh, great staff members in our city who understand and want to do well. Um, it's really a, a, about them being stretched to do it. So yeah, this is the Santa Gertrudis Trail. This is um, a part of the, the segment that we adopted in our Adopt-A-Park program here in the city. And so this is where I'm, I'm doing some sweeping there um, on one of our cleanup days. So one one of the things our adv- one of the activities our advocacy group does is to um, help maintain the trails and promote that adopt a adopt a trail uh, program. We have a couple other groups that do the same uh, to keep those trails running. Um, this this trail runs right right through the backside of Chaparral High School. On the other side of the creek is a community called Harveston, which is a nice calm calm community too. So so kids do have the potential to walk and ride their bikes on a class one trail to this high school and do a couple of other options for middle school and elementary schools. So that's the Santa Gertrudis Trail, gonna gonna be the Northern segment of our Temecula Loop Trail when that gets finished. And we continue to advise on that as as we go uh, along the, our journey here to to become a better uh, bike community. So um, yeah, go ahead. One of the things I want to bring up on on this particular image, I went back to it uh, simply to make the point that it, in, it's incredibly important when cities are trying to build out their off street network of trails and pathways is to think beyond just recreation. And part of the way that you do that is ensuring that you have good connectivity into the neighborhood. And so this is a great example of, of having, you know, being able to get onto the trail and off of the trail. And as you mentioned in this shot here, being able to get to the high school, because there's nothing more frustrating than being 
on this trail and being able to see, hey, I could ride on this to get to school. Oh, but I can't get there from here because I've got a chain link fence here or I've got a impassable area here. So that's one of the things that's really, really important for cities uh, to, to think more broadly about their activity assets uh, like these types of trails is to make sure that you plan in and, and create that connectivity to the neighborhoods and meaningful destinations like stores, like schools, like other meaningful destinations where people will want to get to. Well, I, I think that this is this is an interesting plan, and I, I, I fortunately had a little bit of say in this. A few years back, I was talking to the senior city planner about, well, you have this plan for a loop trail. My concept would be we we have we still have it on the agenda too to build a bike park right in the middle of town. We have a big park called Ronald Reagan Sports Park, which we have a pump track at right now. But we want to do a, a mountain bike park right below our, our public library up on a hill that's connected to this park. And that's right in the center of the city. So my idea was to make, the, make that the hub of our transportation, you include buses, include, you know, trails that come into that center as um, the spokes off of that loop, which, you know, makes it a big wheel. And, and that said, I, I wanted to just share that there is great news with with that trail. We already have, like I said, about seven miles of it now that go under the freeway onto, there's a good picture of it as it's um, coming out from under the freeway toward our old town area. And that then it connects to a trail called the Marietta Creek Regional Trail. That's a trail that is ultimately going to go from Temecula all the way up to Lake Elsinore and then potentially being connected to the Butterfield Stage Trail that runs up to the Santa Ana River uh, Trail. So you could at some point, probably not when I'm still alive, but ride your bike on a class one trail all the way from Temecula to Huntington Beach. So right. um, that that's that's in the making. But this, this trail then goes to connect to our the Murrieta Creek Trail and that segment here in Temecula is called the Old Town Creek Walk Trail. And so you can travel a little over seven miles from our old town, which is a nice historical old town with shops and restaurants and our city hall. Um, all the way out now, the construction is going on at the end of the Santa Gertrudis Trail onto uh, Nicholas Road, which will extend to a community called Summers Bend, still in Temecula. It'll be about, at that point, about 11 miles. And um, when it does connect to Summers Bend, that community is a very well-planned um, new development that has calm streets and um, miles of trails in the community itself, then it will open up into wine country. So you can actually go from, you could have breakfast in Old Town, ride your bike out to wine country, have a glass of wine, and then let it set for a while, maybe have some lunch, and then ride all the way back to Old Town and have dinner in Old Town that night. So, you know, a nice little 16 mile or so ride with some some of the best that Temecula has to offer. So uh, that, and that gets done, you know, for, for several reasons. We have uh, many of the people in our advocacy group are on commissions, the Public Safety Commission, the Community Service Commission. We also have some folks on our city council. So we have a weak mayor system. Right. But our weak mayor is a very strong mayor in that um, he was actually one of the first five members of Bike Temecula Valley. So Zach, Zach Schwenk is um, historically known for um, being a real bike advocate in our town. He was probably the one of the first bike advocates here in Temecula and has been fighting for this, um, you know, pretty much his, his whole life here with his family in Temecula. And so a lot of this gets done because we have those folks, we have people who work for the city staff um, who are bike riders and want this to come to fruition. They live here in town and want to see it happen. There are some things we don't have is people who are just focused on bikes and active transportation. For example, in Austin, I know you have a, an active transportation 
department, basically, within your transportation department. I know that in Fort Collins, they have a person who works on staff for the city who just works on bicycling. You know, those are the kinds of things that um, we, we are hopeful to get um, that we don't have right now. Yeah, and, and given the size of the city, uh, Fort Collins is a great uh, peer city to sort of you know look towards because you're about the same size in terms of you know population, give or take. Uh, probably the only major difference is the fact that they do have a, a pretty major university in in the the city there, and so there, there's a massive uh, university uh, student population. But yeah, from from a size perspective, that's a great uh, a great example, and I think that both cities really exploded at about the same time. Uh, What they are also doing well there is sort of what we were just talking about is those off street network of of pathways and, and trails. One thing that they do have a head start on, because, of course, I think you know that they are a platinum relay uh, uh, ranked uh, city in terms of their uh, League of American Bicyclists ranking of bicycle friendliness. And so it's like a Davis in that they're very, very highly accomplished in terms of some of the stuff that they're doing on street. And so you do see um, them attacking some of their biggest challenging roads that they do have in place there. And with that in mind, let's talk about some of your challenges challenging roads <laughs> or okay. more well, appropriately well, let's, strokes. <laughs> let's do that. Can, um, if you don't mind, can you um, pull up the picture of my wife and I, it's a selfie on the mm-hmm. Pooter on the Pooter river. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because that is in Fort Collins. And yeah. So when I, we, we were right here, boom, here you are. Yeah. Pretty, pretty amazing place. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I I I'll go into some history and then get to these roads, you know, that um, I, I actually took some pictures out on my urban hike yesterday of some of those roads and and situations, but yeah, this is us um, on one of those great trails in Fort Collins on the Poudre River, and um, we happened to the the first thing I did when when I sat in um, this is during the pandemic uh, in 2020, and this is when myself and and four other colleagues sat in the parking lot of our public library because it, you couldn't go indoors and um, decided we wanted to do a bike advocacy group. And the first thing I did was I scheduled a trip to Fort Collins to uh, visit with the um, one of the employees of Bike Fort Collins. And so, you know, I got a good history, but the, the hotel that we were staying at um, had a couple of old Pedigos um, with some skater helmets, and <laughs> we we took those out and did all of the trails of Fort Collins. But you know, there's two things we didn't, the two main things we we didn't have, and we're hopeful to have here in Temecula was number one, they had a main sponsor with Fat Tire Brewing, which is a company that does quite well and is totally into cycling. I was going to say, in fact. Uh- the new Belgian brewery um, is is just you know this trail will take you right basically to the the, the big brewery, main brewery there. Uh, yeah, we we remember riding by it and then and then having one that night. So um, we we feel that you know that main sponsor would be great. You, know, you talk about Benton, Arkansas um, has the, the Waltons. Um, Fort Collins has has um, New Belgium fat tire, and you know that would be a great thing to have. And the other thing that I felt like they had that that I that I'm shooting for, and, and our city actually is working towards it, is to have an employee who works for the dif- district that is working on active transportation. So then that brings us to, um, you know, I come back, you know, dreaming of all what could be in Temecula. Uh, after seeing that great stuff, you know, aesthetically pleasing, um, you know, fantastic network, a lot of bridges, you know, just some some great things in that. And then, and then of course, the state of Colorado, as you know, has a state um, focus on active transportation and trails. So um, I know some of your most recent guests have, have been speaking about that, but um, it's just that whole state focus. Even you go to Colorado Springs, which is a pretty strode filled sprawl city, is making some progress because of that state focus. 
uh, since we're since we were just by the that that wonderful Poudre River um, uh, setting there, I, I want to do a compare and contrast because this is something that jumps out on me uh, for me when when we look at the way Southern California in particular handles their pathways, you know, these, these class one bikeways and, and, and multi-use paths next to rivers is they end up looking like this, you know, and you're like, wait a minute, didn't, didn't he just show us a different photo, uh, you know, that was much more, there's something different with these two photos. Yeah. You, <laughs> And it is, it's almost stamped concrete. You know, you can't see the trail there, but, you know, you can see the edge of it. It's, it's just this wide stamped concrete, you know, grooved. And it's, uh, and it's you know, in Drain nature. Well trail. Yeah. yeah. And it's, yeah, and it's yeah, in yeah, nature. I know. You well, know, that you, was nature. So, yeah. That was, yes. Yeah. It's, it's behind an industrial complex. I, I get it, which, you know, and I, and I think as we move along our Santa Gertrudis trail, it gets a little prettier, you know, than that, but, but going under the I-15 freeway, yes, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna look more like what, what you just showed. And it does in many segments. And, and that is, and that is a, a common theme though, in general, uh, because when people see, the Los Angeles River, it's the same thing. It's been completely paved over. Now they're trying to rewild right. some of the Southern California rivers in many of those locations because yes, uh, originally they did all of this for flood control and the, and they were like, okay, we're going to channel it all in here. This is what we're going to doing without really realizing the unintended consequences of when you pave over literally everything. So yes. Right. Yeah. I see. I see that. So yeah, as we get get closer to looking at those strodes, we have three major east-west strodes. This is the one right in the middle. This is Rancho California Road, and I live in a golf community. So this is me yesterday walking out of the golf community. This is right when I, that signal that you see in the background is brand new. We were excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, so you can see the 50 right there. That's why I, I took that so, shot. So that's pretty, that, that's pretty reasonable. 50 kilometers per hour. Yeah, <laughs> it is the United States. So it's MPH and there is that dotted line to turn into my community. Um, they're suggesting for you to ride your bike in that bike lane. Wait, wait, wait. Um, so, what, what do you say? No, not that. Yep, that's the suggestion. Um, they painted those on there. Anyway, so it's an interesting shot because you, you look out. You know, I can ride around my community. Actually, I do like a 12-mile bo- mountain bike ride just in my golf community, which isn't that big, but um, I go through all the cul-de-sacs, right? <laughs> And I can do that. But when I pop out onto Rancho California Road, it's nice now that I have the light. Still with that light, as you have cars approaching at 50 miles an hour um, and you have the sun setting or whatever, you know, you have to be very, very cautious crossing that that crosswalk. So the crosswalk is is back over where you can see the farthest car um, and it takes you to the other side um, where you can see that nice white fence and that is a really nice multi-use, you know, equestrian type trail, but it's hard packed, hard packed granite. And um, so you can ride your mountain bike on it. You can, a lot of e-bikes will go on that or hybrids, um, not really good for road bikes, but th- they have miles of, of those types of trails that aren't connected. But this one runs about um, three or four miles, uh, three miles along Rancho California Road. So I can take that uh, if you go to the next um, Rancho California Road, I think flipped around facing the, yeah. Um, so I can take that trail. You can kind of see the fence on the other side of the road to that stop sign, uh, stop light. Now I can just go across one sidewalk as before I would have to ride on this sidewalk against traffic on a sidewalk to safely get to the intersection um, and then do two sidewalk crossings to get to our our little community market center. But now I can go on that trail and only cross at one point. And this is one of the this is one of our very dangerous intersections here in town. You've got 50 miles an hour on this strode and then you have Meadows Parkway, which I guess is is close to a strode. It's 40 miles an hour. 
um, going north and south. You, so, you can call it a strode, believe me. You know, it, if yeah. it's yeah, as as Chuck would say, it's a, a strode is a street road hybrid, and so a, a street is going to be you know something that you know, you'd feel comfortable having your child or your grandchild, you know, roll, walk across or roll across. Uh, in other words, it's, it's a very low speed, slow environment. So yeah, yeah. it's a stroke. And if you, we have some, some ideas. So if you go to that next slide, I think I, I put it up, um, one more, uh, uh, well, this is, I'm back. I'm at the end of my, my walk now. And a guy just happened to come by me. So I went out into the bike lane so he could pass me. I, I turned around and took the picture, but he's riding with traffic on the sidewalk with this great buffered bike lane as buffered bike lanes go. You have a, a lot of room, but he made the choice because it's 45 there, 40 and 45, which is, it's also a school zone, but there wasn't any school that day. He's chose to ride his mountain bike on the sidewalk. And I just thought that was an interesting shot. And, um, and I, I can't blame him, you know, in the sense that, you know, as you well know, um, there ain't much protection of, uh, of paint. And so, all, yeah. All, all ages and all levels. And uh, I'll ride on that bike lane on calm days and I'll bring my wife with me and she'll ride on the sidewalk also. She just doesn't feel safe. Um, and then I just, I don't know, John, I just, that happened right after I took that picture. Some guy just decided, and there was a parking slot. If you go a little farther up, yeah. just decided to park his truck with just a potty. A little it, further know? there, dude, a little, little further. Yeah. But I guess that makes it, that makes the statement and you could take that any way you want, but that's, that's about how good that bike lane is. So anyway. Well, and, and, and again, I mean, what we're really, what we're really pointing out here is that, you know, for Gary and John, you know, we're dedicated bike riders, you know, some might even call us mammals, you know, sometimes we're wearing our Lycra and we're out there and we're middle-aged and, and, and we're confident and, and Hey, just give us a shoulder. We're fine. But that's not what all ages and all abilities is all about. And what we're talking about in terms of trying to get more people feeling comfortable riding uh, on their bikes to meaningful destinations, wearing their normal clothes, is you have to make it truly safe and inviting. And if somebody can just easily do that, then clearly it's not safe enough and it's not separated enough. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. Uh, yeah. So that, yeah, that was just a close up of what I was talking about. That's the trailhead. Um, you know, I, I think that, so one of the things that bike Temecula Valley tries to do. So I, I have that, um, nice safe route that I talked about. This is, I took that picture. This is probably, it's right up there ranked in the top five most dangerous intersections in Temecula. It's across from what we call, our duck pond. Um, we do a lot of events there for the city. And then there's a res restaurants on two sides and then a, a shopping mall on the other side and some, some affordable housing. If, if you would, if you turned around and looked the other way there, um, you would see the affordable housing on the left side. There's a big, a huge lot where we're putting in some affordable housing right now, high density. And they have a, a road expansion going on with that. But this is a situation where you're putting affordable housing and people will walk to the shopping center because it's only about um, 400 yards from where they live. They'll, they'll go through the duck pond maybe to get there, but then they have to deal with this intersection or a couple other high-speed um, lights uh, crossings to get pedestrian crossings to get across, which are very, very dangerous. I think most people will get in their car and drive to the shopping center because they're not going to feel safe, especially if they're taking their children or um, elderly person that's living with them. They're going to put them in the car and they're not going to have them walk. Um, so we, we continue to comment with our city planners about uh, when we do these high density construction we need to think about active transportation along with it. And the city is doing a much better job on the north side. They do have a new project that's called um, Uptown Temecula, which will be high density, multi-use 
buildings with um, all of those things um, taken into consideration to try not to have pe- to not to try to have people not not drive when they're going to services um, or school or whatever. So one of the things we do as an advocacy group is we try to map out some safe routes and continue to advocate for infrastructure, of course, and treatments. But we feel like we can we can ride safely through our city. And we try to promote those routes. So it, if you want, you could probably play um, on that. Um, yeah, there is the Myriad Creek Walk. One of the things we do to promote it is we have quarterly rides. Uh, we'll have a theme, like we'll do a farmer's market ride. We'll ride from one side of the Santa Gertrudis Trail to Old Town, where we have our farmer's market. That's the, um, right there is a dirt portion, and then there's a paved portion of the Mirada Creek Regional Trail. Um, we call it the Ale Trail because we had um, a lot of breweries along it um, for quite some time. And then th- these are some of those, again, nice um, multi-use trails that go, that were put in by developments, but not connected. So we have a lot of, a lot of those nice spots where we connect them through some calm neighborhoods. This is just a picture of my, uh, my mountain bike that I ride around town uh, because you're, you're working with different surfaces a lot. So it's the best way to do it. I, I had a little clip of um, safe rides that I that I put out to promote these these um, different rides that that are safe rides through our community, and basically what we do is we combine our trails and our calm neighborhoods. You might have to take a couple extra miles to get where you're going, but you're going to at least get there and and do it safely, and it is possible. Um, I mentioned to you that I um, was an educator. I still am a substitute administrator for the district. And oftentimes I'll try to find a safe route to whatever school I'm working at and make it, you know, make it my, my goal to ride my bike to that school once in a while to, to promote uh, riding bikes. Uh, one of the wonderful things we're doing right now in collaboration with the school district um, and the city and our um, tra- traffic enforcement we are um, starting a, a bicycle education program. So we are right now going to all of our assemb- uh, all of the elementary school assemblies. They do weekly assemblies, and we're we're trying to get to every elementary school to give them some some safety tips um, as a kickoff. Uh, one of the next things we're hoping to do as a school district is to develop a permit program so that um, students have to apply for a permit before they can ride their bike to school so they know the rules of the road. A lot of the concern in the community right now is for mostly our adolescent to young adult group who are riding souped up e-bikes and and not following the rules of the road or the rules of the trail. So it's it's been very, very interesting to see especially the middle schoolers uh, discovering freedom and mobility of, of the e-bike. <laughs> yes, they're definitely free ranging, but yeah, um, yeah for it, sure. Yeah. It's a disaster ready to happen. You know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. sure. Yeah. It's yeah. It, yeah, it, there's, there's a few people that are um, actively working on it. Megan Ramey out of uh, uh, Hood River, Oregon, who will be on the, uh, the podcast once again. Uh, she's a, uh, part of the, the safe routes uh, program up there in hood river. And, uh, uh, she's also, uh, a safety instructor with the league of American bicyclists, but she's really, you know, talking about how, uh, empowering and how important it is that they, these kids are being more free range and actually working on this. Uh, but we do need to, you know, help them out to understand, uh, a safer way to go about it. And, uh, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that the way that, this played out in in the United States in particular, especially compared to like uh, the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands, you see that same level of independence and especially with the girls uh, riding their bikes in packs and being able to, to meet up and go places. And it's, it's so wonderful and encouraging to see. The main difference is, is they're not on e-bikes, they're just on nor- normal bikes and wearing their normal clothes and going about and having a grand old time. And of course, Nobody wears helmets there because it's a much safer environment and, and that's, you know, what you do. I mean, you don't wear a helmet uh, in that situation unless you are doing something uh, like you're on a racing bike or you're on a mountain bike and you're doing something, uh, you know, that's 
quote unquote dangerous. Uh, but it is interesting to see that level of traction that uh, that mobility, you know, has had. Uh, we saw a little glimmer of it in the few years ago when the e the the you know e scooters you know were dropped down into our cities and and we saw the 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 youth you know flock to them because they're like oh heck we've been you know since we were yay tall we were on razors and and scooters and whatnot and push scooters so they were like oh yeah this is fun this is cool and it's mobility and so it's not surprising to me now that to in hindsight to see these things explode but yeah the throttle the throttle e-bike uh, situation is is rather concerning Right. Uh, and I, and I think, you know, I, I like the way, um, she's taking that positive approach, you know, because it, it, it is, it's getting more people on bikes. I mean, one, on one side of our advocacy group, well, we, we have a group that developed a little side group. My, my friend and I decided to take a bike ride one day. He, he rides all e-bikes. He's had some injuries and he used to be a bike rider, but he rides an e-bike. He rides a gazelle now. And we decided to take a bike ride. So there's Dale. And we we asked a friend on, on his street to ride with us. So we all went out on a ride and a few people saw us riding and started asking about their e-bikes. And it grew to four or five. Now there's a, a group of about 90 people who they call themselves easy riders and they take a ride every Friday morning. So, um, I mean, that's the, the real positive side, especially in a community like Temecula with all these hills. People who would want to ride a bike wouldn't do it because of the hills. Now they're out and they, they have that assist to do it. On the the and the bright side for kids, it's getting more kids on bikes. It, it's more interesting to them. There's some technology involved, and it gets them out riding a little bit. We really push the fact that active transportation is a way and a means to have people move naturally, to get them out of their cars, to move naturally. Um, no need to have to do your workout because you've been moving naturally all day, but. Um, one of the fantastic things we got out of that, you mentioned um, the um, metal program, the American the League of American Bicyclists. So I always, go. I always mess it up. <laughs> but so we're a bronze level, and um, one of the things that we got them to do, which was just amazing, not not got them to do, we got the committee to committee to put in to the plan was the criteria for becoming a bicycle friendly community. So now we are held to that rubric that the the league puts out. And one of the things they put out, for example, was to have a, um, a community advisory committee for cycling or active transportation. And we now have that, com we have that advisory panel. And it was, it was Bike Temecula Valley that kind of got that going. And we have all of these things in place because of that one amazing idea that um, the city put that into their master plan. So now we're, we're held accountable to all of those things to, to build our stress-free routes based on what the league is saying. And in doing so, we hopefully, you know, we put in to, to go up one level this year. We hope we move from bronze to silver and we'll, we'll see how we do with that. Yeah. And, uh, and the league does a really good job uh, of helping bring cities along so that they know what those next steps are and what they need to be able to get to the next level. It's important for city leaders to understand that, you know, this is serious business to be able to try to make your environment more welcoming to all ages and abilities and, and really embracing uh, this concept. It's really not exercise per se that we're talking about. It really is that concept of the human body was, was really, you know, meant to be active uh, through little bits throughout the entire day. And, you know, if we go back far enough, you know, a little bit past uh, 10,000 years ago when we were hunter gatherers, you know, we had a pretty good range. And so we were constantly moving. This is the landing page for your, your website. And uh, it, it looks like you've got all sorts of incredible activities that are happening in the city. It's so wonderful to see this level of enthusiasm that you have moving along. 
And, and I get the sense in what you were saying earlier is that you're sort of kicking yourself, uh, realizing that you, you probably could have gotten engaged and get, getting moving you know, sooner, but give yourself a break. I mean, you were actively working, you were raising kids, you were doing all these things. You have a little bit more time now and you're able to do that. If I were to recommend any one thing, it's do whatever you can to engage those younger generations to also get inspired uh, to get, you know, to join you, to join you in your efforts, to join you on the board of directors. What tends to happen with many of these nonprofits and advocacy organizations is they tend to all look the same. They all tend to be mostly white males and mostly older gray hairs. And so anything that you can do to bring youth and energy into um, your movement, that would be my little pearl of wisdom, you know, based on the, uh, you know, 15 to 20 years that I've been engaged in the, these activities. I, John, I mean, I, I think that is amazing advice and I, I keep thinking about it. <laughs> and I, it's I, hard. I, and, I, and I do, you know, when I walked out on that trail and, and thought, Oh wow, this city's going to have a, a trail. And I was in my, I was just turning 40 and I, you know, now I'm, I'm six, I'm going to be 69 next month. And I, what if somebody like me or, you know, had a page like this and I saw it, you know, I probably would have done a little bit, you know, and, and that's, that's just what I'm looking for with people who are so engaged in, in that part of their life, because we need youth, we need diversity, you know, we need the young energy and, it's just, you know, that part is not happening the way I would, would like it to. But, you know, I think what you said in, in, you know, give, give us, give ourselves a break, you know, what, what we have done from those five, five guys sitting in the, the library parking lot to now we, we've built, we've built quite a bit. And I think everything you showed on that page was about, uh, bringing community together for a great cause. And that, that cause is to have a, a healthy community. Yeah. yeah. And, and as you alluded to earlier too, you do have an in with the city um, and you do have some, you know, very uh, familiar and friendly, uh, you know, advocates at that level. And that's absolutely crucial, uh, especially when you're trying to work as partners uh, as advocates, advocacy organizations, uh, you know, having that positive relationship with the city and with the politicians is incredibly important. That level of leadership that is is needed to do some of these tough things. And I, I probably don't think that you've, as a city, have, have taken the step of taking lanes away from automobiles or, or doing anything like that yet. But at some point in time, there may be, you know, those tough dis- decisions that need to get made if, if we're going to actually create a truly protected and separated uh, path. And the only place for us to do this, you know, is an on-street bike lane with some level of protection. There may need to be some real estate that, you know, gets squeezed, you know, away from the motoring public. And so having those strong connections at City Hall and them knowing that the constituents, that you, the voters, because you're growing your movement, will have their back when the haters come hating, because they are, <laughs> they will, uh, you know, that, that, that will be, that will give them, that will, you know, that sense of, of political will and that being emboldened to be able to know that they're doing the right thing. I I agree a hundred percent. That was that was one of our goals up up front was to try to continue to be visible, even if it if it wasn't, you know, if it's not my particular commission, for me to go to a different commission, a planning commission or the safety commission, and you know, comment on some of the things they're doing, or going to city council and with constant reminders about what we're doing, and and being there in force too. We've had a few council meetings where we had a, a big group with wearing, wearing our blue shirts and representing that, you know, hey, we are voters and we're, you know, this is what we want. This is, but I mean, no, you're so right. And I, I think too, one of the things about our advocacy group is we, our goal is to is expand out and be a regional group. And, and we have been participating. We were in the Menifee, city of Menifee Complete Streets project. We sat on that committee, the city of Wildemar Active Transportation Plan. So we want to be a regional 
advocacy group. It's something that we just didn't have in our area. We had San Diego Bike Coalition, LA Bike Coalition. And so, you know, we're going to be a regional, but we, we felt like since we're mostly from Temecula, if we get Temecula right, we can then expand out from there. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it, Gary. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This has been so much fun. Thank you, John. We really enjoyed being here. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Gary from the Temecula Valley Bicycle Coalition. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content I'm producing here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts uh, on Patreon, buy me a coffee, YouTube super thanks right down there, as well as supporting the nonprofit. Uh, just head on over to activetowns.org and click on the support button. And hey, while you're over there at the website, you can also pop on over to the Active Town store and take a look at some of the Streets Are For People swag out there, including water bottles, t-shirts, and all that good stuff. Every little bit helps and is much appreciated. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.